godly power is the type of power that we channel in the direction of others so that we can help them heal. We can help them activate their potential and walk in their purpose. We can help them to see the fullness of who God is. And the thing we have to remember is people experience God through us. This is why mm. Jesus told the disciples, you know, he didn't say, oh, they're going to know you're my disciples by your doctrine. They're going to know mm -hmm. that you're my disciples by, you know, your membership at the temple. They're going to know you're my disciples by how you dress, right? No. He said, they're going to know you're my disciples by your love one for another. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Welcome, friends. You know, we live in a world that champions a good story of overcoming unbeatable odds, yet our human propensity really is to run away from the downcast, the poor, the lonely, and the victims whose lives are marginalized by generational mindsets, trauma, and abuse. But what does it look like to be a modern-day example of Jesus running toward the issues of humanity? reaching into those taboo places to restore dignity to the people that God sees as valuable. Well, it takes compassion, truth, and love. And I can think of no greater example than my guest today. Nona Jones is an international speaker, preacher, business executive, author, and the head of global faith-based partnerships at Facebook. I could read you a lengthy bio of her high accomplishments and accolades, but more importantly, I want to say that along with her tremendous influence, her heart remains grounded in the absolute faithfulness of the God who heals, restores, and brings justice. So without further ado, I want to welcome you, my, my sweet friend, Nona Jones. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you for having me. This is such a pleasure and a joy. Well, I have followed you for a while. So many people do, and we all appreciate your voice. And I just really feel like you have such a finger on the pulse of understanding what woundedness does to people. But uh, you have uh, a way of talking about how that our, our wounds are different than our scars. Okay, let's open up with that. I'd like for you to just speak into that, the difference. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I think if, if we were honest, many of us are walking around thinking that we are over past hurts, um, past disappointments, past discouragements, when in fact, we have a wound that is still open. Um, we have learned to cover that wound with different types of band-aids. Some of us, our band-aids are, you know, our position at work. Some of us, our band-aid is our physical appearance. For others of us, our band-aid may be relationships. And we use these things to try to uh, make up for the fact that we're, we're hurting. Um, whereas a scar, a scar is simply something that reminds us of a wound that was healed. Um, it's, it's a reminder of our victory. It's a reminder of our deliverance. Um, but I think sometimes we assume that we are healed in a place where we're, we're still hurting. And so part of my hope, part of my ministry is to help people realize that because you cannot heal a wound that you ignore. It'll just fester. Yes, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart as well. And, you know, in church culture, we are really kind of pre-programmed and encouraged to uh, profess the right things and think positive, think about the truth. And all, while all of that is good and helpful and certainly a part of our healing journey, I would love for you to help us to understand the need for acknowledging that wound and the pain of that wound, because I think that oftentimes we're burying those wounds and we kind of move in a sense of denial, like you said, masking, and then we're, we're giving power to it. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the, the reality of any situation is you cannot fix something that's broken until you first acknowledge that it's broken. Like that is step one. Um, so I have, uh, I have a new book uh, coming out called Killing Comparison, where I'm talking about insecurity. And I'm talking about how toxic comparison uh, shows up in our identity and how we see ourselves as not measuring up. And what I have found even in writing that book 
is that many times we don't even want to admit that we are insecure um, because there's to your point there's this idea that we should know that we're fearfully and wonderfully made like we should know these scriptures in our head and be able to repeat them at, at will and, and the problem is as i was even praying about um, that whole process of church culture and how we have these things in our head god helped me to realize that there is a big difference between knowing something in your head and believing it in your heart mm -hmm. we have a whole lot of knowledge in our brain and, and we can repeat it at will and yet because our hearts are still broken we don't yet believe it um, talking about the issue of insecurity, for example, um, because we may know that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but we don't believe it. And so when we see somebody else succeeding, we feel threatened because we know we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but we actually believe that something's wrong with us. And so it triggers insecurity. I think in the area of woundedness, you know, we, we know that by the stripes that were, were laid upon Jesus's back, like we know that by his stripes, we are healed, not just physically, but also emotionally and psychologically. And yet, if we were honest, many of us in 20, 30 years after trauma are still hurting and we haven't yet been healed. And so it's not enough to just repeat scriptures, to just parrot scriptures, if we mm. don't yet believe it in our heart. Mm. You know, I think, and, and I think you would probably agree with me, so many people who have such an outer image of perfection um, and lack transparency are probably filled with some of the bigger wounds and the traumas. And I know that in my case, uh, for so many years in my younger life, um, I was really trying to mask and fix and project and, you know, all the things to, uh, and it was so sincere, but, you know, I think that God help us understand how our unraveling and sometimes our suffering and that fire that comes into our lives that, that brings correction, that brings truth is really our blessing because we, we tend to feel like, oh, well, God's not blessing me, you know, if I'm, if I'm in trouble or, or if things look bad right now, if I'm falling apart, his blessing isn't here. His blessing looks like favor. That's part of comparison, isn't it? For sure. Yeah. And I think we have such a limited view of love that we assume that we're only experiencing love if I feel good. But I, I liken it to, so I have, I have two sons, they're nine years old and 12 years old. And, you know, there are things that my sons want to do that I simply will not let them do because I love them. My nine-year-old would love to drive my car, but because I love <laughs> him, I won't let him do that. Yeah. And so he, you know, would get frustrated and angry, but he doesn't yet have the maturity. He doesn't have the hand-eye coordination. He doesn't have the focus. He doesn't even know how to use the instrumentation. And so it would be irresponsible of me as a mother to give my son what he wants just because he wants it. And so to your point, it's not just that, oh, because I'm favored or because I'm experiencing blessing that God loves me. Sometimes it's, because I'm going through this trial, there is something God's trying to build in and through me. And, and because he loves me, he's not going to let me stay in a place of immaturity or fragility where I, I can't handle um, storms. I can't handle trials because he's shielded me from them. And I think that happens. Like I, I know you may have heard of the term helicopter parents. Yeah. Um, that's this <laughs> term of, you know, parents that are just constantly hovering uh, over their children. They will not let them experience any consequences to wrong actions. Mm. Um, they don't want them to experience any uh, pain or any hurt. And as a result, you end up with adults who are very, very fragile, with, who have a, just a huge ego because everything in life was built around them and their feeling. And so I do think that part of the way that God loves us is the, the wounds that we carry as painful as they may be, they can also be instructive. You know, for me, I, I'm a survivor of childhood physical and sexual abuse, mental abuse, all that you can think of. And, and I look back on that period 
And I realized that as painful as that was, it also taught me empathy. And it taught me a level of compassion that I may not have had had I not gone through that to where now when I see a young lady or a young man and they're acting out and they're constantly getting into trouble, I realize that it's not because something is wrong with them. It's because something happened to them. And so I'm able to have the conversation like what happened to you to make you believe that you have to steal or curse or drink or do drugs like what happened? And there's always a story. And so I do believe that part of God loving us is that he doesn't always give us what we want, but he does give us what we need. So good. And that's what I love about you. Uh, you have such a compassion because of your experience and your journey. And I identify with that uh, myself. But, you know, uh, one of the things that the Lord has also shown to me is that there are these two kinds of power that we uh, have a choice to seek after. And there's the power that the enemy offers us, which is really a counterfeit. And I think that's the power we tend to choose to run after when we're wounded. Uh, then there's the power that Jesus offers us. And that's the power to overcome, to overcome those wounds and to begin to change the narrative, to begin to let the flesh die and be crucified in those areas so that we can be healed. Could you speak to how we are hurting one another because of seeking uh, power through the wrong means and even in the church? I mean, how are we doing this to each other? Well, I think first, and you you brought that out so beautifully that there really there, there's there's two two types of power. There's two expressions of power. One is absolutely in in the level of of what I would call the flesh. You know, it's I want to be in control. I want to make the decisions. I want to be able to make this situation work the way I want it to work, regardless of how it affects you, regardless of how it impacts you. And that type of power is absolutely devoid of love. And so you know that it is not of God, right? Because it's all about me and, and what I want. Whereas godly power is the type of power that we channel in the direction of others so that we can help them heal. We can help them activate their potential and walk in their purpose. We can help them to see the fullness of who God is. And the thing we have to remember is people experience God through us. This is why mm. Jesus told the disciples, you know, he didn't say, oh, they're going to know you're my disciples by your doctrine. They're going to know mm -hmm. that you're my disciples by, you know, your membership at the temple. They're going to know you're my disciples by how you dress, right? No. He said, they're going to know you're my disciples by your love one for another. And so that is the type of power that leads to transformation and change. And, and I do believe that many times when we are wounded, we use power as a proxy for our healing. And what I mean by that is I've been, look, I've been there, so I'm not yeah. speaking anything. I don't yeah. know. Early in my career, um, I was the type of leader that I couldn't handle criticism. Mm -hmm. I, I could not have somebody tell me I did something wrong. Um, I was the type of leader that I would use my, my staff and my employees to make me look good because I was trying to basically use my power as a proxy for the wound that I carried, which was a feeling like I didn't matter. And so I would use the people that I had, the resources I had to try to make myself feel better. And that ended up tearing everybody down. Whereas now, you know, however many years later, because I understand godly power, I serve, I serve mm -hmm. people. And, and I'm not looking for validation or credit or, I, you know, there's none of that because I've been healed. I can yeah. now serve people. And I think that's what God wants. That's what God expects is use our power to serve each other. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think we can't get to the love part <laughs> until we're healed because when we're wounded, we're, we're folk, you know, we fostered this very narcissistic culture. Uh, and, and, you know, with all of the mental health issues, I mean, humanity is really hurting right now. And I think the, would you agree with me that the first step really is in laying it down and saying, embracing the fact that I am a faulted 
broken human being who needs you, God. And you're the one who will complete me. You will heal me. That's what, isn't that the first step? And in that healing, as we're able to then love the person of ourselves that maybe we've rejected, I mean, you can't give away what you don't, you haven't received, right? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit about how we love? That, that is so true. You cannot give what you don't have. Um, and I think we spend so much time. I think, you know, when we get to heaven, it's, it's going to be interesting uh, for God to look at us and say, man, I gave you 70, 80, 90, 100 years on earth, and you spent like 68 years, uh, you know, 79 years. You spent all this time walking around wounded, and you didn't even realize that the key to your healing, you already had. It wasn't in somebody apologizing. Um, it wasn't even in being able to change the past. The key to our healing is in our forgiveness, is in our forgiveness. The, the, the people who hurt us and the people who harmed us. Now, mind you, it doesn't mean because you forgive somebody, it doesn't mean you have to be back in relationship with them because there are some people who just aren't safe, right? They're just not right. safe. And yet, I think we do have a responsibility to mm -hmm. release our future from the pain of our past. There are things that happened in our past that if we don't, if we don't forgive, we will never be able to live into the fullness of our future. And I think that gets into this idea of taking up your cross. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. We all have a cross. We all have something that's incredibly heavy and very uncomfortable and extremely inconvenient, but we have to take it up through acknowledging what it is, and following Jesus, what does he say? What does the word of God compel us to do? So we can experience healing. And then once we are healed, we become in a position to help other people get healed. And that's what my ministry is all about, Brenda. And I know yours is too, is yeah. like, look, what I've gone through, what I've come out of, mm -hmm. I see it as a springboard to help other people who are still Amen. in pain, you know? Amen. You know, uh, I can't help but just go here. I feel like, you know, you're so eloquent and so gracious, but there has been, you were speaking to um, being released from the pain of the past so that our future can th thrive and we need to thrive together. And there's so much division right now in the body of Christ. And I would love for you to be able to give context to the white community who is oftentimes defensive. Listen, good people. I know good people who just don't get it. And they, and uh, we're throwing around terms and labeling, you know, wokeness and all these different things. But the bottom line is love and healing and compassion. And, you know, the uh, uh, oppression that some people feel, regardless of their color or their background, I want you to speak into this specific area though of the healing that we need in in the division that we've experienced over some of these areas and help the white community to understand the context of the pain and why it matters for us to listen and to go here uh, well first of all thank you for even bringing this up and i would say to people who are watching this if you if you have felt this compulsion to be like oh i need to turn the channel wait because what I have found, what I have found is that this one issue, this one issue, there is so much darkness around it. Um, and Satan has had a foothold in our country for centuries because of this one issue. And, and God revealed to me several years ago that, that if and when the church really leans into what he says that we have to do on this one issue, this nation is going to experience a revival of which it has never experienced before, and this whole world will. Um, but to give you some context, I'll, I'll start with a personal story, because I think, I think sometimes people don't want to talk about this issue because it feels like an indictment on the entire white race, right? Um, and it, it really isn't that. What it is, though, is it's a recognition of how a, a pattern of decisions has disproportionately affected people 
for no other reason than because of their skin color. To give you a concrete example. So first of all, uh, I am a descendant of slaves. I am one of very few people that actually knows the history of my family, thanks to the fact that I have some historians in my family. Um, but when my uh, great, great, great grandfather and great, great, great grandmother um, were emancipated, it wasn't that the Emancipation Proclamation happened and then you know all the slaves were set free. It wasn't that at all. Um, they had to purchase their freedom. And so what that meant was they had to essentially uh, serve as slaves for years before they could even become free because they had to buy their freedom. There was a point in history, you know, we've had conversations about reparations and people have said, oh, no, we can't do that because we can't afford it. We can't pay it. Well, there was actually a point in history where reparations were made, but they were made to white slave owners where the government paid them to oh. release slaves, but never paid the slaves anything. So the slaves wow. didn't have any housing, they food, anything. And so what ended up happening is those slaves ended up becoming essentially indentured servants to their prior owners. So slavery actually existed long after the Emancipation Proclamation. And the personal story I will share is all the way up to my grandfather. My grandfather, he was a World War II veteran, fought bravely for this country alongside many, many uh, men of color, many black men. Uh, but when he came back to the United States, he was denied a GI loan. So he couldn't get a home for his family like his white comrades could. Uh, he was not allowed to get, go to college like his white comrades were. So my great, my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, he ended up being a garbage collector. Like that's, that's all he could do. Um, my grandmother, she was a, a, a maid. She couldn't get, you know, work anywhere else. They, they were literally excluded from economic opportunity. They had to buy homes in industrial areas of New Jersey because they weren't allowed to live in the suburbs where there were parks and good schools and all of that. Um, and all of that adds up to this reality. I am the first person, the first generation in my family to be born with the full rights and privileges of an American. Like, and I, I, I need people to understand that my mother was born under segregation. Um, she was kicked out of her elementary school, you know? So, um, and what tends to happen economically is, you know, because my family wasn't able to get life insurance and homes and all these assets, if somebody has an issue, my husband and I have to find a way to pay for it because they don't have that. So that's kind of the, the, the history of it. And this is why it's important for people to understand instead of refusing to listen, because that's a tactic of the enemy. Here's the thing about, about God. Remember this, we serve a God who is light, right? Yes. So anytime God is involved, there's going to be light, there's going to be exposure, and there's going to be awareness. I've heard yes. people say things like, we have to stop this woke movement. But the opposite of being awoke is being asleep. God never, ever calls us to slumber. As a matter of fact, the word of God compels us over and over again to wake up, arise, and, and, and expose the hidden works of darkness. And so anytime someone comes to you and they're like, no, we shouldn't talk about that, or uh, you know, they're passing legislation to not talk about it, you have to ask yourself, what is the devil trying to hide? Because God doesn't hide anything. So that's, that's my spiel. And, I, and the last thing I would say is this, as Christians, we have a responsibility to do the right thing on this issue. And I, I'm gonna read very quickly, Matthew chapter seven, verse 21, um, because this is something that should keep us all sober. This is Jesus speaking. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We can think 
that if we just go to church and send money to these charities and and if we just lift our hands and worship that we're going to get into heaven but many of us are going to get to heaven and because of this issue jesus is going to say you did many things in my name but i never knew you and that should give us all a moment of pause it should and i hope that it does for our viewers today i know that you know, part of my own journey was to be able to um, understand that I hadn't known him like I knew him in my deepest pain. In my heart right now, Nona, is that the body of Christ will awaken and will discover him and our need for him in our pain, in this messy, messy place that we're in, because there's beauty here. And he wants to pour himself out upon us. You know, the, the Shekinah glory, I've heard this said uh, by a scholar, that the Shekinah glory in the Hebrew is the female form of God that will come like a mother and lie with us in our dust. And I just think, you know, we are being reminded, as you said, the light is coming in. It is exposing all the wrongs, but it's going to right them. But we first have to allow him. We've got to say, Lord, what are you saying? We, we, we can't be in a position of fear and defensiveness or we will not hear what he is saying and where the heart of Christ is leading us. So help us encourage that person today that, that is in their latter season who feels like, you know, I have wasted most of my life. But here I stand, still hoping there's time. And what can God do with my story and with my life uh, in the next minute? Can you, can you just encourage that person about the healing presence of the Lord in the worst of times? They can be the best of times. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, Romans 8, 28, very simply, our God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that means you, as long as you have breath yet in your lungs, you still have purpose. There is no such thing as an expiration date on your purpose because God created you on purpose. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make extras. He doesn't make duplicates. And so the fact that you are here means that there is something on the inside of you that is necessary for this world to experience. And so I would just encourage you, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, realize that you are created on purpose. And, and it's not just to be hurting and wounded. You are created to be healed so that you can heal other people too. Mm, that is beautiful. And I believe it. And uh, I'm so thankful for a God that does restore and he makes all things new again. I'm headed into my senior years and, uh, you know, it's amazing what God has done. Real quickly, tell us about your book and uh, how we can find it and how we can find you. Oh, for sure. Well, just visit killingcomparison.com. Calm. Uh, the book is all about how to reject the lie that you're not good enough and live confident in who God created you to be. It's time out for insecurity because our God is the type of God who creates us on a secure foundation. So please check it out. Amen. Yes, we will. And I can't wait to get a book myself. Thank you for being with me, my friend. Love you so much. Love you back. Thank you. Thank you. And friends, thank you for joining us. I know you were encouraged. Please come again next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.